Hi, my name is Bill Kinney and I'm a math professor at Bethel University in St. Paul, Minnesota. And as you can see, I'm going to be doing practice problems for the derivative gateway exam for Calculus 1 at Bethel. But, you know, derivative gateway exams are pretty much the same no matter what school you're at, so I'm sure there's going to be plenty of things you can learn and practice here. What is the purpose of a gateway exam? Well, one thing is they are taken without a calculator. The purpose is to, with your own brain, develop both mastery and fluency, okay? Mastery meaning, well, some schools require you to get 100% right, exactly right on gateway exams or else you don't pass. Other schools might say just one wrong or just two wrong, depending on how many problems there are. Okay, so that's developing mastery. You do typically get more than one chance to pass, okay, or otherwise very few people would pass. Secondly, fluency. That means you're able to do things quickly without really thinking about it too much, without really having to expend a ton of brain power trying to re-derive things or rethink about things. Uh, that's useful, for example, in reading other math and science books. You don't want to have to re-derive the product rule every time you need to use it. You just want to have it there to use it. Just like with learning a language, playing an instrument, fluency is definitely helpful. So that's what gateway exams are all about. So. Let's go ahead and work through these problems. There are 10 problems overall, some definitely trickier than others. Another thing to watch out for is being careful about your notation. This is actually very, very important that you understand how to be careful about the notation when doing a gateway exam. I'll show you in the examples as we go. Sometimes you might get tricky problems as well. For example, this first problem is technically not super difficult, but it is tricky, okay? Look right there and there. You might be tempted to say, okay, I need the derivative of e to the x. Um, no, you don't. This is e to the pi. Pi is a constant. This is a constant function of x. Its derivative is zero. Okay? So I could certainly write a zero here, and then there's no x there either. That's a constant. Its derivative is also zero. I could write a plus zero, but you don't need to write zeros when you are adding them. So I won't, okay? It wouldn't be a problem if you did, but I won't. I want to emphasize that the derivative, these are constant functions, their derivatives are zero. I can go ahead and just skip them and go ahead to this part right there. Kind of a strange function in front of the x, but it is a linear function of x. Its derivative is the slope of that linear function, which is the coefficient of x, just pi. Okay? By the way, I am really assuming you've done some practice with derivatives. I'm not going to explain all the derivatives as I go. I'm assuming you know the derivatives of trig functions, for example, exponential functions, logarithms, inverse trig functions. I will remind you of that somewhat, but it definitely is helpful if you've had practice before this point, as well as information about the product rule, quotient rule, linearity, the derivative of a sum is the sum of the derivatives, and the chain rule is the one that comes up the most often. Here we have the, a sum of things. The derivative of the sum is the sum of the derivatives. So 0 plus 0 plus pi plus the derivative of this thing. And you also need to know notationally that, for example, when you take the fifth root of something, it means that thing, whatever's inside there, to the one-fifth power. There's nothing magical about that. That's just notation. It's notation that makes the rules of exponents work even when your exponents are fractions. Okay? But it now allows us to use the chain rule more easily. I need the fact that this is the composition of two functions. There's an inner function that gets done first and an outer function that gets done second. When you plug a number in for x, what gets done first? Well, this whole thing gets done first. x to the fourth minus 5x cubed plus 6x. Think of that as the inside function. Then, once you've got uh, what that equals, then you raise to the one-fifth power. The one-fifth power is the outside function. And so we need the uh, power rule, the fact that the derivative of x to the n x to the n prime is n times x to the n minus 1. Sorry, that equal sign is a little long there. Okay, n times x to the n minus 1. We need that here with n equal to 1 fifth. And we need, again, the chain rule. The chain rule says, I'll just describe it verbally here, then I'll write it down. Take the derivative of the outside function, in this case the 1 fifth power, use the Product, uh, the power rule here with n equal to one-fifth. But then plug in the inside function into that derivative and finally multiply times the derivative of the inside function. Let's go ahead and, and apply that here. 
The derivative of the outside function, you bring down the one-fifth in front to get a one-fifth right here. Then raise whatever's inside here to the one-fifth minus one power, which would be negative four-fifths power. That's a negative four-fifths there. And then you plug in the inside function, again this is the inside function, into that derivative x to the fourth minus 5x cubed plus 6x. Finally multiply times the derivative of the inside function. And the inside function is a difference in sum. You need parentheses here. You're multiplying this whole thing times the derivative of the inside function. That derivative by the power rule and by linearity would be 4x cubed minus 15x squared plus 6 Hope I don't make any mistakes as I go. Uh, I will be checking the video, uh, the problems that I do uh, before I post the video, so there shouldn't be any mistakes in what you're watching. Okay, again, this is a negative four-fifths here. This would be the answer. Again, make sure you put parentheses here. The dot there is not absolutely necessary. It would be assumed you're multiplying, but I like to put it anyway. You don't need to simplify any further, at least if you're a student of Bethel. If you're wondering, do you need to simplify further for your gateway exam, you're going to need to ask your teacher. You know, it's hard enough to pass gateway exams without simplifying, so we at Bethel say, leave it like this. You do not need to simplify any further. Uh, one thing that could be done to simplify would be to write this whole thing as a fraction, which this part you could put on the bottom because you have a negative exponent there, and write it as a, you know, a fifth root of this thing to the fourth power would be one way of simplifying, but you don't need to do that here. All right, um, the chain rule, by the way, can be written in abstract form like this. I'll write d dx for the derivative with respect to x of a composition f of g of x. g is the inside function, f is the outside function. You work from inside to out. g gets done first, then f. The chain rule says take the derivative of the outside function, but then plug in the inside function and multiply times the derivative of the inside function. That's the chain rule. Okay, we're going to use that over and over in this practice gateway uh, problem set. All right, that's the first problem. On to problem number two of ten problems. I will put timestamps on the video here so you can go to the particular problem you're after. Um, I'll probably describe the problem by what rules are needed as well as what memorized derivatives to, that you need. For example, the derivative of sine and cosine is needed in the second problem as well as the derivative of e to the x. This first part of the second problem is kind of funny looking. e to the e to the x, really? What does that mean even? e to the e to the x means e of x composed with itself. e to the e to the x. You could write parentheses like that. Okay, That's a standard notation for what this would mean. It does not mean Oops. It does not mean not equal to e to the e to the x. That's different. That would be the same as e to the e times x. You'd multiply those exponents. These things are not equal. Okay, that's the first thing to realize here. It is the composition of e to the x with itself. I need the chain rule. The derivative of the outside function, which is e to the x, Plug in the inside function, which is also e to the x, times the derivative of e to the x. The inside function is another factor of e to the x. All right. The next term here in this sum, I'm using linearity, the derivative of a sum is the sum of the derivatives, is this a sine of bx plus c. It's assumed here that a, b, and c must be constants. You could pretend it's, you know, 3, 2, and 4 or something. You need the chain rule once again. In the sine function, you have, you have an inside function here, bx plus c. The sine function, or a times sine, is the outer, outside function. The chain rule says take the derivative of the outside function. a times sine gives you a times cosine. The a just stays there by linearity. It's a, it doesn't become a zero, okay? It just stays there when it's, a, it's being multiplied. It's a factor and a product. Plug in the inside function, bx plus c, then multiply times the derivative of the inside function. The derivative of bx plus c is just b. 
You could combine the A and the B over here if you want, but it's fine to leave it this way. For this last one right here, you've got the product of two things. You need the product rule as well. The product rule can be thought of as saying uh, to take the derivative of the product, take the derivative of the first function times the second function plus the derivative of the, <laughs> I've run out of fingers here, of the, uh, uh, the second function times the first function. Say that again. The derivative of the first times the second plus the derivative of the second times the first. Okay, you can do the opposite order too, by the way, because addition is commutative. The derivative of the first function, 5e e to the negative 2x, by the chain rule, the derivative of the inside function, negative 2x, is negative 2. You could combine the 5 and the negative 2 to give a minus 10 out in front if you want. You could also write it like this. If you do write it like this, the dot there is essential. Because otherwise, if you forget it, it's in a, especially if you forget the parentheses, it's like e to the negative 2x minus 2, or 5e e to the negative 2x minus 2, but that's not what you want. You want it times negative 2. So these are tricky little details where people make mistakes. So there's the derivative of the first function times the second function, cosine of 3x to the fourth, then plus the first function times the derivative of the second, or you can, again, think about it, the derivative of the second times the first. The derivative of cosine of 3x to the fourth, I need the chain rule once again. The outer function is cosine, the inner function is 3, to, three times x to the fourth. The derivative of cosine is negative sine. Plug in the inside function. Then multiply times the derivative of that inside function, 3x to the fourth, will give you 12x cubed. I put the parentheses there and there. So this one's essential. I could have put a parenthesis here instead, but this is fine as well. Okay? So the, this whole thing is the answer. Again, at Bethel at least, you do not have to simplify anymore. Just leave it like that to hopefully avoid making mistakes upon simplification. Number three of ten problems is a little easier. Okay, but still slightly tricky at first at least. It's a little weird to have <clears throat> x to the e power but that's it, that is what it is. e is a constant about 2.71828. Use both linearity and the power rule. Bring the e down in the front You'll get and keep the two there. 2e x to the e minus 1. That is correct. Okay, there's nothing about that that's tricky once you realize that um, e is a constant. And it is in the power. We need the power rule. Not, if this is not the same as e to the x. There's e to the x. We have a minus there. By the way, the linearity does apply to saying the um, derivative of the difference of functions is the difference of their derivative. So I do keep the minus sign there. And the derivative of e to the x is e to the x. This one's a quotient. We need the quotient rule, or we could write it as 2x times x squared plus 1 to the negative 1 power. If you forget the quotient rule, you would need the product rule and the chain rule if you write it this way. But let's go ahead and use the quotient rule. Here's the way I remember it. It might not be the same as the way your teacher suggests to you. So if your teacher says remember it a different way, that's fine. I call this the high function because it's high, up high in the fraction, and this the low function because it's down low in the function. And I say to myself, low d high minus high d low over the square of what's below. Okay, that's fast. Low, what does it mean? Low, take the low function. d high means take the derivative of the high function. d meaning derivative. Low d high, derivative of the high, 2x is just 2. Minus high d low means take the derivative of the lower function. The derivative of x squared plus 1 is another 2x. Over the square of the low, or the square of what's below, like that. Okay? There it is. It's very tempting to simplify this. And you, and you could, but you might make a, mis make a mistake. You could distribute the 2 through here to get 2x squared plus 2, and then this is a minus 4x squared. You'd end up with a 2 minus 2x squared up top? Yeah, okay. 
I think I got that right. But you might make a mistake if you simplify. So I would suggest, at least for my students, leaving it like this. And here's your answer. Okay? I won't take the time to do it here on the video, but I would encourage you to try differentiating it this way with the product rule and the chain rule, and then seeing that you get the same thing in the end. Okay, you need to know properties of exponents, for example, that x squared plus 1 to the negative 1 is the same as 1 over x squared plus 1. 1 over x squared plus 1 quantity squared would be the same as x squared plus 1 to the negative 2 power, for example. Okay, on to the next one. Number 4 of 10. This one is pretty quick. The very last problem, number 10, is the trickiest. H prime of z. By the way, I am using different letters here sometimes for both function names and variable names, and you should use the correct letter according to that individual problem. If either you're my student or your teacher wants you to use those same letters. All right, uh, first of all, the cube root of z is z to the one-third power. So we need the power rule. We get one-third z to the one-third minus one power would be negative two-thirds power. Plus the derivative of four to the z. Hmm, what kind of function is that? That is an exponential function. You've got the variable in the exponent, not a power function. But it's not e to the z, it's 4 to the z. There is a rule for differentiating b to the z with respect to z, say. And I do want my students to memorize it. You get natural log of b times b to the z. Interesting thing about that is if, if b is e, then you get natural log of e here, which you should know pretty quickly is 1. The answer would be e to the z when b equals e, the special number that's about 2.71828. It's an irrational, though, so its decimal expansion goes on forever and ever without a repeating pattern. Anyway, here, b is 4 in this case, so we get natural log oops, of 4 oh, come on, times b to the z is 4 to the z. Not very much of an expert with a smart board, so sorry that I'm making these goofs up, goof ups with the smart board. Here we have a product of two things, z times e to the negative z. I need the product rule. The derivative of the first is just a 1. I put the 1 there, you wouldn't have to. Times the second function plus the first function times the derivative of the second one, and we need the chain rule. The derivative of negative z is negative 1. You can also make that 1 over here, essentially, by putting a minus sign in. So this thing is the answer. And that is a negative 2 thirds there with that exponent. Fifth problem looks harder than it is. It doesn't look super hard, but it, it looks harder than it is. It's actually beneficial, for example, with this first thing, to avoid the quotient rule. If you have just one thing in the bottom like that, you can break it up into two fractions. And for emphasis, I'll write the bottom as y to the first power. And then you can simplify those fractions by subtracting the exponents. And e to the x and natural log of x are inverse functions. e to the y and natural log of y are inverse functions. e to the natural log of y is just a y. I haven't taken, taken the derivative yet. I'm just simplifying the function. Subtract the exponents here. 3 fourths minus 1 is negative 1 fourth. So you get y to the negative 1 fourth. 4 fifths minus 1 is um, negative one-fifth, you get y to the negative one-fifth. And then again, we have the y there. So the derivative is k prime of y equals, use the linearity and the power rule, negative one-fourth y to the um, negative five-fourths, one-fourth minus one is negative five-fourths. 
something that some people will have trouble without a calculator, that's something you should practice. Subtracting fractions like that. Get a common denominator in that case of four. Then we have a minus one-fifth. Y to the negative one-fifth minus one would be negative six-fifths. And then the derivative of Y with respect to Y is just plus one. The quotient rule can also be used. It's not wrong to use it, but especially if you can simplify to this very quickly, this is a little bit quicker. But you have to be proficient and fl fluent with your algebra there. You know, you might say, well, I'm more likely to make a mistake. If that's the case for you, then go ahead and just use the quotient rule. This one's a little tricky, partially because of we're using a as the independent variable. It's not very typical. Partially because you have a pi power there and a pi power there. It's maybe a slightly tricky problem, but it's, if you're careful, it's not that hard. Use linearity in the power rule. Bring the pi down in front to get 3 pi a to the subtract 1 from the exponent. Pi minus 1 power. And then this is just a constant times a. It's linear in a. It's just a constant. Its derivative is just a constant, 3 to the pi. Okay, you could think of it in terms of the power rule if you like. Bring down the 1 in front and then have 8 to the 0, which is just 1, although technically we're assuming a is non-zero there because 0 to the 0 power is undefined. Anyway, this is the answer. On to number 7. This one's kind of tricky, especially if you don't know your notation. First of all, t times square root of t is t times t to the 1 half power. Add the exponents. This is the same as t to the 3 halves power. So use the power rule. Bring the 3 halves down in front. Subtract 1 from the exponent. Careful now on these next two. This is sine of t to the negative 1 power. Okay. It's a composition. Do the sine function first, then raise to the negative 1 power. I need the chain rule. The outer function, think of it as t to the negative 1. Is, its derivative is negative 1, t to the negative 2, by the power rule. But plug in the inside function. Then take the derivative of the inside function. The derivative of sine of t is cosine of t. Assuming implicitly that t is in radians, that's true. That's the assumption here. So there we have it. Um, this is the same as 1 over sine t, meaning it's really the same as cosecant of t as well. And you may have memorized the derivative of cosecant of t. It ought to be negative cosecant of t times cotangent of t. Be another way to write that. All right. This one, though is not the same as that. This one is called the inverse sine function. It's a different function than this. It's not the reciprocal of the sine function. It's not the cosecant function. It's a little unfortunate notation, which is why you sometimes also see it written in a different way as arc sine of t. That's probably a better notation in a sense. But it is an inverse function of sine of t, at least if you restrict the domain of sine of t. And for the derivative of that, you just need to memorize it. Its derivative is plus 1 over the square root of 1 minus t squared. That's just a memorized derivative, okay? Kind of weird, the derivative of this inverse trig function is not a trig function at all, or an inverse trig function. Kind of strange, but true, okay? Uh, that fact can be derived using the chain rule, but I won't go into the details about how to derive that fact. I'll leave that for your book or your teacher. Finally, with this one, we need the chain rule, as you can see. In fact, we even need it a couple times. Think about natural log of 3t all raised to the negative 2 sevenths power. There's really three functions. There's a, a most inner function multiplied by 3, 3t. Then take the log, that's like a middle function, and then raised to the negative 2 sevenths is like an outer function. But we can think of the um, natural log of 3t as our initial inner function. 
Take the derivative of the outside, something to the two, negative 2 7 power by bringing the negative 2 7 down in front. Then raise that to the negative 2 7 minus 1 power, which would be negative 9 7 power, where you plug in the inside function. Then the chain rule says to multiply times the derivative of that inside function, natural log of 3t. But we need the chain rule for, for that derivative as well. The derivative of natural log of t is 1 over t. But plug in the inside function, replace t with 3t. Then multiply times the derivative of that inside function. The derivative of 3t is just 3. There we have it. I, I'm really tempted to try to simplify this, but I think for the sake of not making a mistake, I won't. You know, you could cancel the threes, for example. You could multiply 14, negative 14 times negative 2 sevenths. Well, it would be plus 4. Yep, that would be another thing you could do to simplify this. But just leave it like this, especially if you are one of my students. That would be fine. Getting close to being done here. Just three more problems, 8, 9, and 10. Number 10 is the trickiest one. We'll have loads of fun with that one. Um, by the way, just an editorial comment here. It's pretty amazing that these rules work, OK? You get these really complicated derivatives, but if you haven't made a mistake, they're right. That's a pretty amazing thing, especially when you go back to thinking about the definition of the derivative in terms of limits. Can you imagine doing limits here with these functions? No, I can't imagine it. These rules are pretty amazing, OK? And being a Christian, I praise God for these things. These are beautiful aspects of reality. So we have here, first of all, the product of two things, x cubed and square root of 1 minus x to the fifth. We need the product rule. For this uh, derivative of the second thing, we'll also need the chain rule. That's a composition. Looking at that 1 minus x to the fifth being the inside function and square rooting being the outside function. Anyway, take the derivative of the first to get 3x squared times the second function. I put a dot there. You wouldn't have to put a dot there. Plus the first function times the derivative of the second. Think of 1 minus x to the fifth square root of that as 1 minus x to the fifth to the 1 half power. So you bring the 1 half down, plug in the inside function. 1 half minus 1 is negative 1 half times the derivative of the inside function would be negative 5x to the fourth. Of 1 being 0. Okay? Make sure the dot is there if you're writing it like this. And I would include parentheses as well just to be safe. Arc sine is the same as the inverse sine function. Okay? This is the same as inverse sine of 2x. Same derivative as in problem number 7, except we have the chain rule as well here. 1 over square root of 1 minus whatever's in there squared, 2x quantity squared. You would need parentheses around the 2x if you leave it like this. You could also write it as 1 minus 4x squared if you do not use parentheses. Times the derivative of 2x is times 2. Uh, with this one, we need the product rule. That's a product there. And we also need to remember the derivative of secant or rederive it. And we also need the chain rule. The derivative of the first function is 1. I'm writing the 1, but I wouldn't have to. Times the second function plus the first function, use parentheses, times the derivative of the second. The derivative of the secant function is secant times tangent. But I need to plug in the 3x in both spots. Secant, oh come on, work, here we go. Secant 3x, tangent 3x times the derivative of 3x is times 3. Okay, so this is kind of a messy answer, but it is the answer if I haven't made a mistake, and it's pretty amazing. I don't want to derive that with limits, that's for sure. I don't want to go back to the definition of the derivative. These rules are amazing and cool, but they are easy to make mistakes with. Number 9. Bit tricky looking as well. Oh, I put a Greek letter in there. Why did I put a Greek letter in there? Oh, just for fun. I like Greek letters. They're, they're so beautiful. Look at that one. 
what, what Greek letter is that? That's the Greek letter uh, psi, P-S-I. And if you're a physics major, you'll see lots of psi's in your physics studies, especially with quantum mechanics. Psi prime of t. Okay, I'm just doing it for fun. I like doing that. But if I'm using that notation, then you go ahead and use that notation. It's just so beautiful to write. Go ahead and write. What's the derivative of tangent? Remember it? It's secant squared. That's one to remember. Or you could write tangent as sine over cosine and use the quotient rule. Secant squared, I'm using the chain rule as well. We really have the composition of three functions. I'll initially think of this thing as the inside function. Plug in the inside function times the derivative of the inside function, which is also a composition. I need the chain rule for its derivative as well. The derivative of e to the t is e to the t, but plug in cosine of t times the derivative of that inside function, which is negative sine t. Okay, so that is the derivative of this whole thing here. And then the second thing is this is the inverse tangent function, also called the arc tangent function. This is the same as the arc tangent of e to the negative t. I need the chain rule again. I need the memorized derivative of the arc tangent function is 1 over 1 plus t squared if t is the variable. Um, but again, we have an e to the negative t in there, so we have the e to the negative t quantity squared times the derivative of e to the negative t, which is going to be by the chain rule, negative e to the negative t. Okay? And then leave it unsimplified. This is your final answer. Double checking to make sure I don't make a mistake. Right. I do make plenty of mistakes, so I need to really be careful sometimes. We all make mistakes. Mistakes are fine. You just have to try to correct them, okay? And practice uh, correcting them. And practice trying not to make mistakes or practice them in such a way that you can easily find your mistakes. Sometimes it's not always easy. But Here we have more Greek letters. Alpha of beta. So we want alpha prime of beta. Oh boy, yeah. I need the quotient rule in both cases. Or with this first one, I could write this 1 over e to the negative 3b as top, this whole top times e to the positive 3b. And then I'd have a product with three things. I'd need to use the product rule twice in a sense. Maybe I should do that just for practice. This is the same as beta squared sine 2 beta e to the positive 3 beta. Um, Probably is easier to use the quotient rule, actually, but let's go ahead and use the product rule. Initially, I'll think of it as this times this, but then when I find the derivative of that, I'll need the product rule again. So, alpha prime of beta, the derivative of the first is 2 beta, then I have the sine 2 beta, e to the 3 beta plus the first beta squared times the derivative of the second. This is the second. I need the product rule again. Use parentheses. Beta squared times the derivative of this, which is going to be a sum. Now this is the first function, sine of 2 beta, and this is the second function, e to the, e to the 3 beta. The derivative of the first is... Sorry about that. Uh, how do I get rid of this? There's my, I'm just completely inexperienced with whiteboards here. Get rid of it. Uh, that's okay. Let's just... Can I drag it? No. Okay, we'll just deal with it. Cosine of 2 beta uh, times 2. Chain rule. Uh, times the second function, e to the 3 beta, and then I have the first function, sine of 2 beta, sine of 2 beta times the derivative of the second function, e to the 3 beta, is e to the 3 beta times 3. Put the end parentheses, you're multiplying beta squared times that whole thing there. Okay? Make sure you don't forget things like that. Then we have minus uh, the derivative of this thing, and boy, what is that now? Go away, come on. 
There we go. Hey, the wrong way. That's a quotient. Two cosine three beta over five plus L and four beta. And I think it's best to practice the quotient rule here. One more time. Low D high minus high D low over the square of what's below. Make sure the low comes first. And by the way, if you didn't hear me say that because you jumped to this problem in this video, you want to go back to an earlier problem where I talk about <clears throat> the quotient rule. I think it's number three or four or something like that. Low D high, get the order right. Low, low D high means the derivative of the top. Derivative of two cosine three beta is gonna be a negative two sine three beta times three. Low D high minus high D low. It's because of the minus sign that you don't want to get that order wrong. I D low, I need the derivative on the bottom. The derivative of five is zero, so I don't have to write it. What's the derivative of natural log of four beta? It's one over four beta times four by the chain rule. Over the square, what's below? Five plus natural log of four beta, use parentheses, all raised to the second power. Okay? Yikes, wow. Or amazing, this is amazing. We can find the derivative of this thing, okay? These rules are really amazing. So that's the end of the video. I hope you got a lot out of it. Thanks for watching.